Hi, and welcome to our Ephesians study and session three. This week, this session, we're going to be looking at um, Ephesians chapter two. Now, just as with last week with Ephesians chapter one, if you haven't had the opportunity yet to read it through either individually or collectively, now just suggest that you pause the video now and take the time to read through chapter two together and then hit play again um, to carry on with this session and the introduction um, to the chapter. So hit pause now if you want to read it um, to start your evening together. Now to state the obvious, chapter two continues on from chapter one, but not just numerically, but also in theme. Last week, you remember looking at chapter one, um, we looked at some of the amazing things that God has done for us, including, for example, that God has lavished his grace upon us. In chapter two, Paul continues to talk about the themes of grace and the amazing things that God has done for us. And he starts using this language of we once were, but now we are. In fact, he uses this several times throughout this chapter. He says, we once were dead in transgressions, but now because of God's great love, we are alive. We were once far from God, but now we've been brought near. We were once foreigners, but now we are fellow citizens. The goodness of God is made abundantly clear to us by Paul. And I want to encourage you, take note, just as we did last week with chapter 1, in chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, take note of all of the things that Paul says God has done for us. Included in this section is verse 6. Let's read that together just now. It says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You may remember at the end of chapter one, Paul prays a, a prayer for the Ephesians and in turn for us, asking that they would know, asking God that they would be able to know the same power, the power of God, the same power that did several things that resurrected Christ, that seated Jesus at the right hand of God, that placed Jesus over all authorities in heaven and earth, and that made him sovereign over all things. Here in verse six, Paul places our identity firmly in this work of Christ. He says that we also have been raised up with him. You may have seen a baptism service here at TCC or elsewhere. One of the things that baptism symbolises is this going under the water, dying to our old self, dying with Christ, and then coming out of the water to embrace our new life and to be resurrected with Christ. Another way to describe this would be to say that we as Christians are resurrection people. You may remember that in our Lent 22 series, What Good News, we looked and unpacked what the gospel is. And one of the key components to the gospel was the resurrection of Jesus. It's so important that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that without the resurrection of Christ, our faith is futile. We once were dead, but now because of Jesus' resurrection, we are now alive. Eugene Peterson puts it this way, that we were once sin dead, but now we are resurrection alive. And Eugene Peterson in his book, Practicing Resurrection, which is based um, on the letter to the Ephesians, um, encourages us to think about what it looks like to be a resurrection people. He says the following, it's understandable that we carry cemetery habits and assumptions into this resurrection life. We have, after all, been living with them a long time, if you could call it living. And so we require a patient, long-suffering reorientation in the resurrection conditions that prevail in this country. Living into the full stature of Christ, our resurrection pioneer and companion. That actually, as resurrection people, it can be easy to go back to our old way of living, but we are called to live differently, to embrace this new life. Now, I don't want to get too sombre on you for a moment, just, but just picture for a moment that you were to die right now, that you died. And then in a matter of minutes or maybe in an hour or so, you suddenly come back to life. You would, I'm sure, wake up a bit disorientated and a bit confused. You'd stand up. But when the realisation hits you of what has just happened, you've died and you're now alive again. I am sure it would change the way that you live, that you would have a new appreciation for life, that you perhaps wouldn't take some of the things that you took for granted and um, for granted again, that you would live differently in light of the resurrection that you've received.
This is the challenge for us as resurrection people. How will we live differently in light of the life that we have received? Because the reality of it is, is it is a gift. It is something we have received. It's not something we can achieve for ourselves. I've never known a dead person who's been able to raise themselves from the dead. We hear stories and we read them in scripture of people like Lazarus who are raised from the dead. But it wasn't something that Lazarus did that achieved that. It was a gift of God. It was the grace of God. And so actually key for us in understanding how we are to live in this resurrection life is understanding it is an act of grace, a gift of God. This is what Paul talks about in chapter 2. He talks about the grace of God. Grace, the sacrificial and generous love of Jesus which makes possible for us our relationship with God, but then also our participation in the resurrection work of God in this world. See, part of the grace that actually God gives us is not just to receive new life, but also to inv invite us to be bearers of this life through the good works that he calls us to do in this world. Because the reality for us is, is that there is still work to do. Even in our daily and ordinary lives, we will face the regular struggles and the earthly realities of life. But the context in which we experience these and the context in which we work has now changed. We are now resurrection people. And so the context in which we live and breathe and work is grace. Our context is now grace. This is what Paul talks about in verse 10 when he tells us that there are good works for us to do. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This passage tells us that we have good works to do, but it starts with Paul saying we are God's handiwork. The context in which we work is understanding that God has worked in us first and continues to do so. That we are God's work and we are called to do God's work. We are God's work and we're called to do God's work. There's a danger perhaps that we separate these two, that we focus on just one or the other, that we're excited about being God's work and we, we keep asking God to do more in us and we have our hands out ready to receive, but we're never willing to put our hands out and to work. But there's a danger on the flip side that we perhaps never put our hands out to receive and to see what God is doing and to spend time in relationship with him. And we focus instead on the serving, on the giving of our time and in the doing for God, but not spending time with God. But actually the two are inseparable, being with God and working for God. For we are God's handiwork that has good works prepared in advance for us to do. And so, in fact, for us to mature and grow as Christians, we need to understand that cannot take place apart from works. We cannot mature and grow in the Christian life apart from works. And in fact, this idea of growth and maturity is something that Paul picks up on later on in Ephesians. If you've read the whole book in preparation for these sessions, you might have noticed that theme in Paul's letters that the goal for us is maturity and growth. And we cannot achieve that without the works. But we can't do the works until we understand the context in which we do them. Understand that grace is the context, that what God has given us, the gift of life, that we are God's handiwork, is the context from which we then work. Then into the second part of Ephesians, from verse 11 onwards, we're told more about where we once were and where we now are as a result of all that God has done through Jesus. You may remember that in chapter one, we are told the purpose of God is to unite all things under Jesus Christ, to bring all things together under Jesus. And here we are told that God begins to do that and began to do that through the church by bringing Jew and Gentile together. Now, perhaps we don't suffer from that Jew and Gentile divide today. We may appreciate that as many of us, I'm sure, are, are Gentiles, that we don't have the Jewish heritage, that we have been grafted in, that we've been included in this amazing work of God. But we can still appreciate that this reconciliatory work of God is taking place in the church and in our church. That if we were to look at the people around us on a Sunday or perhaps even in your life group today, we could recognise that there is nothing else that would bring us together. Maybe some of you are looking around right now and thinking, yeah, amen. 
but be encouraged that actually the reconciliatory work of God is being worked out in us in our very meeting together today on a Sunday or whenever that might be. That not only is the church invited to be a participant in this reconciliatory work of God, but it is asked to be an example of this reconciliatory work of God. And part of the way that the church continues to be an example of the work of God, we are told by Paul, is that we are the following things, that we are fellow citizens, that we are the household of God, that we are built upon a solid foundation which has Jesus at the centre, that we are joined together as the temple of God and that we are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2 is another amazing chapter sharing with us the work of God, which is the gift of grace. The context in which we now live as resurrection people, the dwelling place of God. And we who are described as God's own handiwork now have work to do. This work is set in the context of grace and we grow and mature in our understanding of God and in, in our new identity as his resurrection people by participating in the works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. You once were dead, now you are alive. I hope you enjoyed discussing chapter two together. Look forward to seeing you next time at session four when we look at Ephesians chapter three. God bless. Mm -hmm.